That's actually sort of a nasty question, isn't it? but never mind. Uh, I once had an English teacher who said you could not be an English major unless you had a dirty mind. Uh, and I qualify in that, that regard. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I got into this business. And then, if you have some questions for me, that would probably be the best thing. Um, we have about a half an hour, that's what they told me. But before I do that, where are you from? Do you go to school? I heard like three different schools, what are they? Georgia Southern, GSU. Uh, I listen to ACDC too much. Somebody, somebody speak alone, because it all turns into... Armstrong. Armstrong? I got it. All right. I started to write stories when I was probably... Wait a second. I probably started when I was eight years old. And I did it, uh, I think, originally because I missed a year of school. I had uh, tonsillitis and some kind of a heart thing that passed off. And so um, that, that year I was home, and I was in bed a lot of the time. I guess it was scarlet fever is what it was. And uh, I started by reading comic books, and then I would make up my own comic stories about Superman and Batman, and, and uh, then I started to write my own stories. Uh, my mother was very encouraging. She was never, you know, fall down at your feet kind of thing, like, oh, Stevie, you're terrific. But she said that if I, she liked the stories and she liked to pass them on to her sister. She had four sisters. And she said, uh, if I would write stories, she would pay me a quarter apiece for them. And that was my first freelance. <laughs> that was my first freelance job. So I made a few bucks that way. Uh, she gave me a typewriter for my birthday at some point. Uh, at that point, I was reading a lot. And uh, one of the things that I resist is telling you, you must do this or you must do that. But I can tell you that if you're not reading a lot, uh, you, you're losing some weapons that you would otherwise have in your quiver. So uh, I read a lot. And uh, another thing that I can remember my mother saying was that uh, she would say, move that um, milk to the bottom shelf. She said, milk takes the flavor of whatever it's next to in the icebox. That's just one of those mom things, you know. Like, if you don't wear your rubbers outside, you'll get sick, or this or that, the other thing. Uh, and you know they're bullshit, but they stick in your lungs. It's the same. But it's true for writers, I think, when they're, when they're beginning. Uh, you take the flavor of whatever you're reading at that time. So that if I read Edgar Allan Poe, I wrote like Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, if I was reading Ray Bradbury, everything turned into a Ray Bradbury kind of thing. Uh, the last, that, that affliction finally passed for me, I think, when I was in college. Uh, <laughs> it was a really schizophrenic time for me because I fell under the spell of two very different writers. One was William Faulkner and the other was Raymond Chandler. Uh, so I would get up in the morning and write something that sounded like uh, uh, Snopes, you know, when Snopes and all that, and these long involved sentences. And in the afternoon, everything turned hard boiled on me, you know. Uh, so, but that's part of the process of, of just writing and little by little, you develop your own way, your own style. Um, style is a word they use in college a lot. It's a mysterious word that to me has almost no meaning whatsoever. I mean, you might as well talk about the style of your face when, you, when you're looking in the mirror in the morning. Or, I mean, okay, there is such a thing as style, I guess, and it, but it's always a conscious thing. It's the way you dress. It's, this, that, and the other thing, but you can't change your fingerprints, you can't change your voice, you can't change the way you, uh, the way that you express yourself. After a while, as you get older, that, that, that starts to come out on its own. So don't worry about it, just, just read and just write your shit. That's all. That's the thing that you do. And uh, anyway, I started to submit stories to various magazines 
the ones that I liked, the ones that I read, the work. Um, some of the fantasy magazines, some of the science fiction magazines, mystery magazines. I also sent stuff to the Atlantic Monthly if it was felt like that kind of thing. Obviously, you have to read the market because there's some stories that they will look at um, at a straight magazine. There aren't as many as there used to be, but the opposite side of that is there's a lot more stuff online. Um, I know that I look very young, but there was no online. <laughs> um, and uh, I got all the usual rejection slips, the, the printed ones, and every now and then you'd get uh, a line at the bottom that an actual human being had written on, like, this isn't so bad, you know, and I treasure those, but I had a nail that was pounded into my wall in my bedroom, and I put the rejection slips on that nail, and uh, eventually the nail tore right out of the wall, and they all went on the floor. So I put them all in a desk drawer, put the nail up, and started with a fresh batch. Um, the first story I sold, I think I was 19 or 20 years old, and I sold it to a magazine called Starling Mystery Stories. Uh, the check was for $35. I was insane with joy. This was after, like, uh, maybe 600 rejections, maybe not that many, maybe it just seemed like that, but I was totally fucking insane with joy. You know, I just screamed the house down. And uh, that was, well, I can't say it was my big break, it was just my first sale. And, and I advanced after that to uh, sales of as much as $35 a while. Uh, and then, in my senior year in high school, I spent the summer uh, working in a, a woolen mill, and uh, it was, you know, to get money for college. And uh, they, they took a week off in the uh, in the middle of the summer, and uh, they said, if you want to work, we're going to clean the mill from top to bottom, or if you take the week off, you can take it off without pay. Well, I took it off without pay uh, because I broke my wrist. So I didn't work that week, and when I came back, the guy I worked with in the dye house said, Steve, you should have been there, buddy. You would have loved it. He said, they, we had fire hoses down in the basement, and we flushed out rats as big as cats. And that kind of stuck in my mind, you know, rats as big as cats, and the idea of the, uh, the hoses, you know, using the hoses to flush these things out. Um, and stories are that way, they kind of stick in your mind, there's a little grain of something in there that just sort of sticks and stays. So that did, and uh, about four years later, when I was getting ready to graduate college, I worked for the, the newspaper, the college newspaper, and everybody had cleared out uh, for the summer. I was there with two or three other guys. And I started to write this story called Graveyard Shift about people were cleaning out a mill and there were just rats underneath and then there was a sub-basement where there were giant rats, mutated rats. And uh, I just let it all go. I just made it as gross as I possibly could. And I was laughing maniacally, you know, borrowed type rats. I had a great time. And I got it done and uh, I, was, I was going with a girl um, who's now my wife, been my wife for a long, long time, a lot of years, a lot of good years. And uh, at that time, we were both college students, and I gave it to her to read. Her name's Tappy. And uh, she said, this is really gross, but I think you can sell it. <laughs> I said, well, I don't know where I can sell it to. And I got a writer's market, which is something you can still get online, and I found that some of the men's magazines still publish fiction. I had had the idea, this again goes back to the idea of read the market, read the market, read the market. I had the idea that if you got those men's magazines, I was talking about upscale, like, like Playboy. I don't think Penthouse even existed at that time, so it came along shortly thereafter. But for all these magazines with names like Gent, Rogue, Dude, <laughs> Adam, you know, the magazines where something flops out when you hold it like that. <laughs> but they were skeezy magazines. And so I thought what they published was porn. Well, it turned out what they published was what they called men's fiction. But it didn't have anything to do with sex. Who knew? I didn't know. <laughs> so I sent this magazine, this story, to a magazine called Cavalier, and they bought it for $200. 
$200. I mean, to me, that was a fortune. Now, I went to Ted and said, let's get married. <laughs> and she said, well, why, why, don't we, why don't we wait for a little while on that? But we didn't wait very long because I advanced to selling stories to men's magazines for as much as $500. And uh, so, yeah, we got married and we had some kids and I was working in a laundry because I, I had a teaching degree but I couldn't find um, a job as an English teacher. So I was working in the laundry, pumped gas for a while. Uh, that was back in the days where we, we charged twenty two nine per gallon. And uh, if you got a fill up, you got your choice of a loaf of bread or a glass. These tough cafeteria style glasses, you could throw them against the single block wall and they bounce. <laughs> so I was doing those jobs and I was writing in my spare time and uh, the baby was always sick. And there was one of these days where we had come back from seeing my mother and the car was obviously going to break down. And our daughter had an ear infection. There was no money. We were actually totally, totally flat. I mean, it was a low point. And uh, we got to the little apartment that we were renting where we didn't even have a phone because we couldn't afford to keep one in. And there was one of these envelopes in the mailbox, you know. And, uh, and it had the return address of Cavalier Magazine. And I can remember Tabby saying, please God, let that be money. <laughs> It was. It was $800. It made a big difference. So eventually I got a teaching job. Um, do I want to say this? <sighs> teaching is dangerous for writers. Okay? Teaching is dangerous for writers. Sometimes it's the only safe harbor you can find. Um, there are plenty of writers in colleges who have uh, contracts that allow them time to write, but I always felt a little bit like, the kids were terrific, but it was like having jumper kids hook up to your ears, you know. They were taking a lot out, but I was still writing, and I wrote a book called Carrie that I didn't think was very good. It start, actually started out as a short story, and uh, to my surprise, uh, Doubleday bought it. Um, it was only $2,500, but it allowed us to replace our car, which was dying to death of the cancer of the transmission. <laughs> and uh, as I say, we had a couple of kids, and I can remember one night, my wife and I lying in bed, and she, she said, will there be any more money from this? And I said, well, there might be a paperback sale. And she said, uh, how much do you think that might amount to? And I said, it might be $60,000, but we would have to split it with the publisher, but 30 would be enough to live on for a year. I could write another book full time. And she said, well, I hope that happens. I got a call. Uh, on Mother's Day in 1973, my wife was actually at her mother's, so I was in the house by myself. And uh, my editor at Doubleday said, we sold the paperback rights. And I said, how much did you get? And he said, $400,000. And the strength went out of my knees. I was in this ratty apartment, you know, this sort of a tenement apartment, and I just sort of slid down. So I was sitting in the doorway between the kitchen and the living room. And I said, you said $40,000, right? And Bill said, no, $400,000. And uh, I just walked around the house. I mean, I didn't know what to do or what to think. My wife wasn't there. I couldn't celebrate. It was Sunday. I wanted to get her a present. I finally decided I had to get my wife a present. So I went out, and it was Sunday, and we were in Bangor, Maine. Everything was closed except for the Rexall drugstore. So I went and bought her a hair dryer. <laughs> 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 and that's how I became a writer. I guess a, a big shot writer now. Uh, people treat me sometimes like I'm a big shot. And I don't really like it. It makes me uneasy. Um, I don't really know how to take it. I'm certainly not treated like a big shot at home. <laughs> uh, believe me. But I guess what I want to say, and I'm going to take some questions, um, is that there's no mystery about me, okay? I mean, it's wonderful that you came to see me, and it's wonderful that you clapped and everything. And I'm sure every now and then it sort of comes to me that people have read my stories and they made, the stories made them happy. 
you know, pass some time, maybe on an airplane or maybe uh, um, in, a, in a period where you don't feel so well. I'll tell you one other thing. Uh, until December 28th of last year, I felt like I was 40. And by December 29th, I felt like I was 90. I had something, one of these comic diseases we used to laugh about when we were kids, it's called sciatica. And it just started with a little bit of pain in the back, and the next thing you know, I can't walk, I can't lie down, I can't sleep. Uh, I'm going to the doctor and say, drugs, hard drugs. <laughs> they, 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 they give you a few, but they don't waste that shit on people that are actually in pain. That's <laughs> supposed to be a party! So, but listen, you know, so there were a lot of nights when I was up late, and uh, not feeling very good, and I found these books, uh, that I just totally ignored. Uh, it's a series of five books called A Song of Ice and Fire, uh, George R. R. Martin. And uh, I fell into those books. The guy is just a natural balls to the wall storyteller. And it took me out of myself. And uh, that's, that's a priceless gift. That's a wonderful thing to have. But there's no mystery about me. There is some mystery about what it is that I do and what you do. And that is the the, the actual act of writing, which has always made me feel really happy and really privileged to do it. And it's mysterious. Uh, when it comes, it comes. And it's just, it lifts you up, and it's, it's a great thing. This is something that I think a lot of times that they don't talk about, which is the mystery of the actual, that's the art part of it, the craft of it is just putting your ass in a chair and saying, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to try to get people to read what I do and so on and so forth. But it's a it's a great job. But just remember it's just it's just us guys basically doing something um, that's maybe a little bit easier on the muscles in the body than on it. But it's, it's a good thing. Do you have questions? Do you have something you want to ask? Yeah. Um, I just want to say that I really, really enjoy Maximum <laughs> Overdrive. Maximum Overdrive. One of the few. That kid enjoyed that kid. <laughs> <laughs> sort of thing. You find out that, you know how that, that I was saying about give him enough rope, he'll hang himself? Well, when you've got some renown, you can get enough rope and hang yourself in Times Square. You know, on a Vista Vision, a case in point, Whitney Houston, okay? That's a terrible story, but it's, it's a common one. The only reason that it's wall to wall is because, uh, well, you know what I'm saying. But I would, yes, I would like to direct another movie at some point. It would be nice to do one, you know, as I say now that I know what I'm doing. But movies have are, are never been my main focus. I love them, but I'm basically into the word. Somebody? Yeah. Uh, more of a technical question. I, I, mean, I loved both It and The Stand. But why in the ending of It, there's a lot of like fork sided of like the songs you use, and but why is there one like that in It, but maybe not necessarily like in the stand? In the stand? Um, you mean a, a lot of song lyrics and that sort of thing? Right. Yeah. The, the, the book of my, I, lo I, love, I love music, I love rock and roll, um, and I always have. And for me, it, those things, those song snippets have a, an emotional gradient. Uh, so that there's a little hot zone there. And uh, I did use a lot of lyrics. The one, the book that I used the most lyrics in was actually Christine, uh, where I, I thought to myself, I'm going to divide this book up into three sections, uh, teenage car songs, teenage love songs, and teenage death songs. And I'm going to have a little, a little snippet of a song at the beginning of each chapter. Uh, and uh, I did that, and at that time I did it because I could. Uh, song lyrics were, were cheap to buy at that time. You could, you could get something for $50, and uh, it's changed. The whole thing has changed. Uh, I wrote a book called Duma Key a couple of years ago, 
And I really wanted to use the lyrics of the Judas Priest song called You Got Another Thing Coming. Uh, it was like uh, one verse, uh, uh, somewhere out there there's a fortune waiting to be had if you think I've given up your land. You got another thing coming. So it's like four lines. They wanted $50,000. And it wasn't them. It was whoever owns the rights to that song. And uh, I thought to myself, well, that's just bullshit. Four lines. And they just rhyme A, B, A, B. There's nothing too fancy about that. $50,000, I'm not going to pay that. It wasn't even the money. It was the principal of the thing. So I wrote my own lyrics. And actually actually attributed that song to Bill Benbro and Richie Tozier, who were two of the kids from It. And it was the same idea. And the only problem with it is it doesn't have the same grade. And I've been in that situation before. Uh, there's a book uh, called Hearts in Atlantis, um, where the lyrics of Twilight Time, an old doo-wop song, are very important. And I had to hold on to them. They were expensive, but damn. The new book has one lyric in it. And it's, uh, the book is 11 it's got some lyrics from a Rolling Stones song called Honky Tonk Women. I knew what I wanted to do with the lyrics, okay? They just basically had to be any rock song that we would recognize as being an anachronism at that time that were raunchy, okay? <laughs> and I picked Honky Tonk Women because they were raunchy, but mostly because, God damn it, the Stones always used to be cheap. <laughs> Dylan still is cheap. Springsteen is still cheap, but see, they control the rights to their own music. Uh, apparently, the Stones sold theirs off, so it used to cost two hundred dollars. All at once, it's forty grand, and you know to yourself, it's just not right. It's not like you know Finnegan's Wake. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't use them as much as I did, but I always felt like uh, that idea of opening a book with an epigram that sort of set the tone or set the mood for the for the story. It was a terrific thing, and a lot of times in, in older books, uh, those tone setters and mood setters were, were poems, and I just think that for my generation, your generation, uh, rock and roll music is the poetry of, uh, it's, it's what people relate to emotionally, and a lot of times that's what I'm interested in with an epigram. The only real problem with rock lyrics is a lot of times they look quite stupid on the page. So you know, <laughs> You have to be careful what you use. There are a few people who like poetry, but yeah, in the back. What was the thought process on writing the new book, the JFK book, and how did you get to this book? Uh, I'm not going to talk about that now because I have to talk about it later. <laughs> <laughs> I went through my cabbage twice. <laughs> it was a long thought process. Yeah. No, that's true. That's true. You can't you can't scare people about something unless you're scared yourself. Um, when those kids in the story it finally get down uh, to uh, below the city and they see uh, it in its next to final shape, it's a giant spider. And that's because as a kid, I was always just absolutely terrified of it. I don't know why. Something about the alien shape. They're not humanoid in the least. They have do it. Damn legs. <laughs> uh, but they're, to me, they're just grotesque. I feel that way about, about bats and about rats, but I've never, I don't think that I, maybe I have. I've written something gross about almost everything sometimes. See? <laughs> but I can't remember ever writing very much about snakes. Well, shit. There's a snake in the new book. But I'm not really afraid of snakes. I sort of like them. But there was a period when my children were small, when I visualized every awful thing that could possibly happen to them. But I was also able to write about children then in a way I'm not now because I had little lab test cases, you know, <laughs> right there on my feet all the time. And that was a great thing. But raising children is like feeling great pain. When that time passes, you, you, you lose some of the immediacy of, of the feeling of the memory so that you have to move on to, to other things. But, you know, you touch on a really good point, and that is the best stuff comes from what you know. But that doesn't necessarily mean write about what you know, because that would uh, allow you 
it would just put off limits a lot of things uh, that people would like to write about. Like, uh, obviously, none of us were at the Alamo, but that doesn't mean you can't write a book about it at some point. Yeah, sir. I think I was about 10 years old and I got caught reading Gerald Cave in my grandmother's closet. Um, is there a person, uh, or who's your first person to evaluate the readability or the merit of your work before you send it out? My wife. <laughs> your my wife. wife. But you are a sick pup to be reading that <laughs> one. <Yeah. laughs> Yeah, you're a sick puppy, but I like that in person. I do. Yes, sir. Uh, a lot of the young writers have a problem convincing themselves that their own stories are worth reading, so they have to convince themselves that it's worth writing about. Obviously, you're known for being a prolific writer. What's uh, some other ways you come up with story ideas or just, you know, invest in other ideas? I think that coming up with story ideas is like, it's like sex in a way. The, the, the less you worry about it, the better it, it, it all seems to be. Um, I try not to, I try not to say to myself, I've got to get an idea, I've got to get an idea, I don't have anything to write about. I, I've had uh, a few periods in my life, I had one recently, and I think it went along with the, the back pain and everything, where, uh, I felt flat, that I didn't seem to have anything to write about, or the ideas that I did have didn't seem to pan out very well. But for me, the best ideas are the ones that come 